um, um, just jump right in. So thank you so much for starting your day off with me here, talking about balancing and managing frustration on Rainbow Six Siege. Kind of introduction uh, for those that don't know me. Hi, my name is Lainey Dixon. I am a user researcher at Ubisoft Montreal. Um, I work as an embedded researcher within the Rainbow Six Siege team uh, and have been doing that for about two and a half years. Uh, so that's why we're going to be talking a bit more about uh, Rainbow today. Uh, specifically, I want to be talking about some kind of the history of balancing on Rainbow Six Siege and how over time our user research team has become a bit more integral into that process. For those of you that are maybe not familiar with Rainbow Six, um, I'll give a quick little primer so you can kind of get up to speed. It's a 5v5 kind of PvP attackers versus defenders. There's 54 different playable kind of heroes or operators as we refer to them. Uh, each of these operators have a kind of unique set of utility that's available to them. Uh, they have diff two or sometimes more different primary weapons, secondary gadgets, their, and their own kind of unique ability. So the unique ability is what kind of sets each of these operators apart. Uh, we also have a very large player base, uh, 55 million players and growing every day. Um, so balancing for this, as you can kind of imagine, is interesting. And over the last kind of uh, nearly five years now since release, we've gone through a lot of different processes about how we manage this. Historically, um, balancing, I mean, obviously balancing is very, it's a very tricky thing to do. And on Siege, we kind of have several different large buckets of population. Uh, we're, we have a very uh, strong esports scene. Uh, so we have a very high level of play happening there. We also have a kind of large ranked pool of players. So ranging from lower skill levels up to a very high skill level. We also have a large population of kind of more casual or unranked play. This obviously makes balancing very tricky. Um, historically, balancing for us on Siege has been completely data driven. Uh, this is something that started from the very beginning, was looking at the, the kind of available backend tracking that was available to us and making decisions there. Um, trying to make the balancing decisions by just looking at the data of the highest ranked players. Uh, the goal here was to be as objective as possible in our decisions to produce statistically the most balanced operators possible. But as you can imagine, this really lacked any consideration to the kind of perceived feel of an operator's performance. And there was no way for us to kind of see or measure the impacts the balancing changes we were making were having. So I'll give a little bit of a sneak peek of the process. Um, so this is our balancing matrix. Each season, we create one of these balancing matrix uh, for each of our kind of factions, so our attackers and our defenders. Here, we're looking at the attacker faction uh, from our year five, season one. So this was very recently. This was actually published on our website just a couple weeks ago. When we're looking at this graph, we have on the x-axis is the win delta. So this is the average win ratio when an operator is picked minus the average win ratio when an operator is not picked. We often refer to this as the kind of quote power level. Along the y-axis, you'll see the presence. So this is the pick rate of an operator when not banned. Uh, we refer to this as kind of the popularity. When we're looking at all of the little icons in this graph, those are the operator icons. So these are all individual operators on the attack side of things. We can also see that there's kind of four primary quadrants. So the top left quadrant is going to be what we would consider to be operators that are underpicked or too strong. The top right is going to be overpicked or too strong. Bottom left, underpicked and too weak. Bottom right, overpicked, too weak. Obviously, this is a very oversimplification of what we're seeing here, but it's an easy way to kind of head off that balancing process. The exact placement of the quadrants also changes season to season as more operators are introduced and balance between the factions is evaluated. But ultimately, the goal is to have the operators close to that center point. So how we take how we get this data is we obviously calculate the wind delta and the presence for each of the operators when we specifically look at a very high ranked level of play of PC players. So we're taking a very high rank segment of players and plotting 
the operator performance on this matrix. To see a little bit about how we actually put this into practice, I want to talk a bit more about a, of an example of looking at uh, the balancing matrix from year three. So this was some time ago, but I want to talk specifically about an uh, operator named Blitz. So Blitz here is a operator that has a ballistic shield uh, with forward-facing flash charges that can blind anyone in range. Uh, unlike our other shield operators in Siege, Blitz can also wield his shield while sprinting, uh, making him a fairly difficult operator to deal with. Uh, he, so at this time, he had been kind of in the top left, underpicked two strong quadrant for several seasons. Uh, but our designers wanted to increase his popularity. So, over time, kind of leading through the end of year two, going into year three, he received several buffs, including coming into the year three patch one with a speed increase. What we saw was that the pick rate did increase from about 10 to 20 percent. So this did achieve the goal to increase the popularity. So for our designers, they were quite happy about that. However, frustrations and complaints online skyrocketed. Players across multiple populations were extremely frustrated by these changes. We had made an extremely powerful shield operator that was extremely fast at sprinting, which you can imagine is probably not the best ideal situation. However, other than really looking at kind of community sentiment and discussions happening online, we lacked a reliable way to evaluate and qualify what was happening. So since in theory he had become more balanced, we weren't really taking into consideration kind of what this perceived feel of balance was for our players. And this was really getting to the point where we started to realize we needed to do something new. We'd been operating balancing in a very data-driven way for a very long time, and we wanted to kind of open up the way that we were thinking about balancing. So we wanted to see what we could do about supplementing the data for making design decisions during the balancing process. And we kind of landed on kind of four primary goals. So we knew we wanted to understand the different facets in balance and fairness according to our players. So from their own perspective, what was happening? We wanted to understand what facets of an operator can cause frustration. Uh, we wanted to also educate ourselves on how our players are discussing balancing. What types of terminology are they using? How are they discussing the kind of comparison of one operator to another? These types of things. We also really wanted to ensure that we were adding more transparency to the balancing process. This was really important for us both internally and externally. We wanted to be able to provide more context internally when making decisions, but it was also really important to us that we use the information that we were getting from this kind of additional supplementary process in educating our community about balancing as well. We'd been leaning towards a large scale survey for some time. And we did know that a mass survey wouldn't give us all of the information, but could help really shine a light on the problem areas. Additionally, as a bonus, we saw that the survey could give us more ways to evaluate how our balancing changes were working or not. Uh, and this could really act as a seasonal pulse point. So we decided that we wanted to move forward with a survey. We decided that we wanted to look at frustration. And we knew that this would be the easiest way to get information from our players, as opposed to asking them to explain why something felt good. Uh, for the note, though, we do actually gather information about what feels good from players. Um, we just use that for other things. But following several discussions with our designers, we landed on a very kind of generic list of aspects of an operator that could be perceived as frustrating, but that could be evaluated for all of our different operators and they were all largely based on available balancing levers. So kind of things that were already implemented in the game that we could tweak to make these changes. So by asking players what was the most frustrating with these different aspects of a given operator, we could kind of narrow down the frustrations to a much smaller bucket to help us guide those changes later on. So we decided to make the survey. So here's kind of an example of what our first kind of iteration of the survey looked like. Um, each season we release new content, including a new operator. 
which is typically what will change the kind of the meta or the way that the game is being played. And that alters the pick and win rates of each of the operators. So we, this is why we decided to send the survey each season. So roughly about the kind of six week point of into the season, every three months, we send this survey. It goes out to 50,000 North American players on PC. We do send it to the kind of entire population of skill. Um, so like I was mentioning earlier, we have kind of a very large casual base, but also a large kind of uh, higher ranked play. Uh, we don't include our kind of esports professional players in this survey. We get feedback from them in other ways, uh, but we do kind of include the, the whole bell curve of ranking. Um, and we are able to kind of counterbalance that later by uh, making adjustments based on the rank of the responses. In the survey, players are able to select the top three most frustrating operators to play against. They can select the most frustrating facet and provide explanation. Yes, an open box for 50,000 surveys. <laughs> um, we do kind of look at, we don't always dig deep into all of the responses at once, which is why I felt fine with having that open box there. We're able to kind of manipulate uh, how much of the chunks of data we're looking at at any given time. So it becomes much more manageable than trying to look at everything all at once. Depending on the state of balancing, we'll get, we will add additional questions into the survey. Um, with, whether we're looking at maps or the kind of the power level of secondary gadgets, we'll also kind of ask players where they go to find balancing information, which has led to some really interesting insights actually, and kind of some other separate projects. Uh, so we tend to kind of try and keep this survey fairly open for additional questions to be added to give more context when needed. Sometimes the designers want to get more precise information about something specific, so we'll add some questions in there. However, the one thing that stays the same is always the rankings, so that we can always have that pulse point for each season, for each of our operators, as we kind of continue on in this balancing uh, the, the survey process. So let's talk a little bit about what the data actually looks like and some ways in which that we've used it in the past. So when we're calculating out the frustration scores, our data scientists and intelligence analysts takes the extract from the survey and enters it into a table and does a lot of really fancy heavy calculations, which I can't fully explain, but I'm gonna explain them to the best of my abilities here. Um, what the output is, is a sum of frustration score. So basically what's happening here is our players are able to choose their top three most frustrating operators to play against, keeping in mind they can't choose the same operator more than once. They also can choose their top three most fair operators to play against, again, can't choose the same one more than once. Once we look at the kind of the whole aggregation of all of that data, the scores are weighted based on the overall frustration of each ranking they receive. So how often did they appear as the number one frustrating? How often did they appear as the number three? How often did they appear as the most fair? All of this is taken into consideration and weighted for ranking of the player. So we are able to track the rank of the respondent. What we get as an output is the sum score. So this is charted on this graph. This is looking at one individual season, which is why we see one individual line. You can see the sum frustration scores on the far left. Along the bottom is the different names of each of the operators listed alphabetically. So we have one kind of line for each, uh, for each season. When we want to compare scores for multiple seasons, this is something like we're getting, this is more like what we would see. Each horizontal line, uh, it represents a season. And we can look at now more as the most frustrating operators appearing on the left. So as we're adding in more seasons, we're kind of averaging out what the scores actually look like. So here, instead of seeing it more alphabetically, we're seeing all of our defenders listed more as our kind of most frustrating on the left-hand side and our more fair are leaning more towards the right-hand side. In addition to being able to just look at the sum frustration score and altering kind of adjusting which seasons we want to look at, we also have several sliders we can use to adjust different views, like adjusting for the player skill rank. So if we wanted to look at only players of a certain rank, uh, we could see what the average kind of the sum frustration score of an individual operator is within that specific audience. So this allows us a lot of flexibility to look at that very initial score to see where we need to dig a bit deeper. 
So we're always kind of starting first with this kind of sum frustration score and then going back into those more um, open-ended questions from the survey to get more context. So about a week or so after we get the extract of the survey, our analysts produce this table and we're able to start making comparisons with our balancing matrix. So I want to talk through a little bit how we've actually used this data before, uh, going back to our lovely friend Blitz. Um, so if we're looking at the year three, season four, so this is a couple seasons after what the graph that we were looking at before, um, we've been making some small tweaks to Blitz as well as shields over the course of year three, um, which eventually decreased his wind delta and his pick rate. Um, so we had included a few different buffs that were scheduled to come kind of over the next following seasons, which could potentially impact all shield operators, but did have potential to buff Blitz. So we were closely kind of monitoring him after we had had that in huge spike in frustration, after we had increased his speed. So Blitz had kind of stayed on our radar. And even though we, we were kind of disappointed as we were seeing that his pick rate and his wind delta were slowly starting to kind of go down, because we had to make some quick changes to reverse to kind of reduce the overall frustration that we had seen earlier in the year. But so even despite the fact that he was still kind of moving down in a kind of more negative trajectory, we did want to continue looking at different options of buffing him to make his wind delta a bit higher as well as increasing his pick rate. However, we had learned that we need to be able to be, we need to be a bit more cautious and not run, rush into changes with him again. Uh, so we decided to spend some time consulting the frustration data first before we started discussing what changes we wanted to make. When we looked at the frustration data for that season, we saw that Blitz had the highest frustration score. We knew that his frustration was high. We just in theory of kind of his design and from what we had heard continually from our community. But we wanted to consult the data and found that what what exactly was frustrating, um, not just the fact that he had the shield, but kind of what aspects were frustrating about him that we could actually tweak. This is when we started to see that when we dug into the, the, the frustration survey data, we saw that the special ability was the primary frustrating facet. Narrowing down further into the responses, we identified that the duration and the number of uses of the flash was a huge kind of contributing factor to the significant frustration. When we presented this to our balancing team, this resulted in us making a significant change to his shield flash ability. We actually significantly increased the cooldown of the flashes mounted on his shield. So rather being able to use the flashes every two seconds, you could now only use the flashes every seven seconds. So even though our designers were very focused towards making kind of a buff, we wanted to be able to present to them that we saw that there was this additional frustration happening and that it was important for us to kind of start making changes to reduce that when possible. So one season later, when we pulled the frustration data again, we saw a drop in his overall frustration. So the kind of the beige line was the first initial pulse point, and we looked at the following season, which is the pink line, we see that he's gone down pretty good amount. We also see that going down to the blue line, which is two seasons later, that he continued to drop in frustration. So this was a really interesting exercise for us because while we didn't necessarily increase the popularity or the win rate of Blitz, we did achieve one of our kind of new balancing goals of reducing frustrations when playing against a specific operator. This will really opened up a window and kind of a, an opportunity with our team to start thinking a little bit more about uh, making more kind of data informed decisions about our balancing rather than only looking at the win delta. After successfully applying the frustration rankings for several seasons, we started to kind of ask ourselves what we could do about the data about our kind of fair operators. Uh, what things are kind of getting brought up the most and do we see that reflected consistently across operators that are considered fair and what can we learn and use with this? Some of the questions we were wondering is kind of what do players prioritize when it comes to a feeling of fairness? Um, we measure fairness on the same graph, so you'll see kind of the same thing as our Operators on the left-hand side are considered more frustrating, where the operators on the right-hand side are considered kind of the less frustrating. They typically have a kind of negative sum frustration score. 
So we wanted to see are the facets that players find the most fair kind of an inverse of what the players find most frustrating. So we decided to pull an operator with one of the negative sum frustration scores and take a look to see what it could teach us. This brought us to Jaeger. So Jaeger is actually a really interesting example because he falls very far off the edge of the balancing matrix. He'd consistently been climbing in presence. The, though his wind delta wasn't necessarily alarming, his presence was. We knew his frustrations were high with Jaeger at a pro level due to gathering their feedback through other mediums. Uh, but we wanted to get more context as to what the larger population was thinking. So we consulted the frustration score. And what we found was quite interesting is that even though over the course of several seasons, he had a negative sum frustration, a number uh, which was largely at odds with the data we were seeing with the balancing matrix. We wanted to dig a bit more about how players were defining the balance and which facets of balance they prioritize for fairness. And if we could start to see those facets um, when they start to become more frustrating rather than fair. And we wanted to use Jaeger as kind of our kind of example here something that was found immensely frustrating at high levels, yet when we look at the kind of normal distribution of rankings in the population, he is considered one of the most fair. Looking a bit deeper into what the players were saying, by looking at some of the key words from the comments. So we saw that he had a very kind of easy to understand and identify ability, meaning that his counters to his ability were quite clear. At higher levels of play, he did have a good kit combination, but it was mostly only leveraged to the maximum capacity at the highest level. He did have a perceived good weapon, even despite it being statistically mostly average. Uh, and we did see though that players were also noting that he is a three speed, which is the fastest speed possible, but that when we kind of looked at the priority level here, uh, we started to see some kind of interesting um, interesting things we saw with our frustration as well. What we noticed when looking at Jaeger was we started to see the similar facets emerging that contribute to both the fairness feeling as well as the feeling of frustration. So we started to compare what those facets were and see if we could make a list that was kind of prioritized about how players were thinking about the balance. And we landed on kind of four main facets. So what are the counters available against a specific operator? So do they have clear counters? What is the usefulness of their overall kit combination? Um, what is the gameplay impact a single operator can have? And what is the risk reward kind of trade off of using the operator's ability? We saw that when we were looking at frustrating and fair operators that we could start to prioritize how players were feeling about them based on where they fell within these kind of four facets. This really helped us create some guidelines when we think about balancing operators and what changes can be impacted through kind of creating a framework which can support the more kind of quantitative data heavy aspects of balancing we've been using. And though it felt kind of initially counterintuitive, these facets really helped move our team from the historically more objective data-driven only focus balancing to being more data informed. So we've been able to do a lot of interesting things with the survey and I could talk a lot more about a lot of other cool things that we've been doing but I know we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, but ultimately we kind of had four main successes coming out of this. We were able to help add context to the balancing process. So we were able to be more precise about the areas of frustration which needed to be addressed and providing important context for our designers to make those decisions. We helped our team move from a strictly data and kind of, kind of data driven to be more data informed approach by supporting them with the data they need to make more informed decisions and moving towards a more player centric focused balancing. We also in helped enhance the balancing framework by looking at the kind of key balancing facets and adding those as guidelines when discussing the balancing to support the kind of quantitative data. We also helped add transparency in the balancing process for the community by adding more detailed balancing information shared online through our designer notes posts, as well as speaking directly with our, with our community and openly sharing balancing information, adding that transparency to our processes and to our players. So I actually talked with some of our content creators a few weeks ago going into much more detail about how we use the frustration survey. You can find, um, there is a little bit of a link here, you can find it also put on my Twitter as well. So if you're interested in hearing a bit more about it, uh, we talked for much longer than I had the opportunity to talk here. Um, but yeah, any questions? Sorry, I had to speed through that pretty quick. Um, I'm gonna go to, I think, Kirk's question. 
So in terms of calculated frustration score, if playing against a character isn't frustrating at all, could that mean that they are underpowered? Uh, it could be. So we don't necessarily strictly only think about things about being kind of frustrating or fair. We're starting to use the frustration score as kind of helping to shine the light on potential issues. And what we can see is when we're looking at the, the rankings, we can start to break down kind of how players are discussing a given operator. Um, we're trying to find ways to be more, to find more about that information and being able to evaluate whether something's kind of un underpowered. Um, and we've been exploring that a bit in the past, um, but I don't have any like real specific example of how we've used that. Um, oh, I think Ashley's in the next one. Okay. When balancing Rainbow Six, do you only look at PC play players for balancing or do you consider consoles if only PC Y? Uh, so we do, so for the balancing matrix, we do only look at PC players. Um, it's based on the, the way that we look at the kind of the balancing population. It's uh, the, the way in which the game, the meta is very different and the balancing is very different between the two. So we have to be able to kind of keep some level of consistency, which is why we've maintained looking at the kind of PC population. Um, I do think that we do see that there are some it, differences with uh, balance based on the kind of the inputs. So we'll see like um, operators that are more that have like shotguns, for example, are much more powerful on console. We'll see a lot of different um, balancing statistics when we look at players on console versus PC. Um, but we, it's really difficult for us to balance for all the populations for all of the consoles. So we start with the kind of the main balancing matrix and then we can adjust accordingly. So we are able to look at the balancing matrix based on console players. Uh, but right now the survey has just been PC because it's difficult for us to get a big enough of a population each time. Um, but it's not to say that we couldn't look at that in the future. Um. Okay, so Fred, can you delve a little bit more into how the frustration scores are calculated based on the collected survey data? So the frustration score exactly is looking at the, the rankings. So an operator is able to receive an either kind of a one, two, or three most frustrating or a one, two, or three most fair. Each of those kind of six available options are weighted and then calculated into a sum frustration score. We also take into consideration the, the ranking that we're looking at. So there is some calculation that's made based on whether or not you have a higher ranking. It's weighted towards not skewing things. So if we had too many high ranked players in the survey, we'll kind of weight things to make sure that it's evened out to the population. Um, I can't speak entirely exactly to how all of that is done because it's actually done by our, the frustration, uh, the, the scores themselves are done by our data science team, not myself. I'm guessing I'm going to get kicked off soon. Um, but if you want to come find me on Twitter, I can answer some more questions.